Hello, Bia. Welcome to Science Hub. I'm Lara Mdivi. I'm from first student at Laureate of Convent Valley Road. And I'm Elaine Mahome, a student at Laureate of Convent Valley Road from Paul. So in this episode, we are going to do qualitative analysis, test for cations. So we are going to look at the cations in different solutions. So we are going to look at magnesium, presence of magnesium ions, zinc ions, iron 2 ions, iron 3 and iron 3 ions. So <coughs> we are going to make a solution which contains magnesium ions and we are going to use magnesium sulfate. It's a soluble salt. So we take a spatula and put about two spoonfuls of the salt. And we're going to make a solution of it. We shake it vigorously so that all the particles will be dissolved. So, as you can see, there's a white piece down, but we don't need to worry, we just separate the two solutions. So remember, as you said before, when you're testing for cations, you're going to use um, sodium hydroxide first and then ammonia solution. So you put a few drops of sodium hydroxide. As you can see, there's a white precipitate, which is insoluble, but that's when you put with sodium hydroxide. So um, you add more sodium hydroxide until in excess. The white precipitate persists, indicating that magnesium ions are present. So that makes the solution to have magnesium ions. Then we test it using aqueous ammonia solution. So um, we put a few drops. You see a white precipitate is there and it's insoluble, then you add more. The white precipitate persists, indicating presence of magnesium ions. So let's move to um, test for zinc ion. We're going to make a solution out of zinc sulfate. You do the same thing you did in the previous procedure. You take your spatula and you put about two spoons full. Then you add water to make a solution. Shake it vigorously to ensure that the salt dissolves in water. Then you divide the portion into two. So first I'm going to use uh, sodium hydroxide to test for presence of zinc ions. So you put a few drops. So, um, as you can see, there's a white precipitate being formed. So, you add more sodium hydroxide. As you can see, the white precipitate dissolves in excess. This indicates that um, zinc ions are present in the solution. So, we test again using ammonia solution. So you put a few drops of ammonia solution first. You see there's a white precipitate being formed. Then you add more. You see the white precipitate dissolves. This indicates presence of zinc ions. So 
We are done with magnesium and zinc iron. Let's move to iron two ions. So um so we make a solution out of iron. So I'm going to make a solution that contains the iron here. So shake the mixture as you look at. Then separate the solution into two. So I'm going to use um sodium hydroxide solution. As you can see, there's a green precipitate being formed. So when you add excess sodium hydroxide, the green precipitate still remains insoluble in excess. So this indicates presence of iron two ions. So let's move to iron three. So before I was doing iron two. So we are going to iron three. So most manufacturers indicate iron two as ferrous sulfate, while iron three is indicated as ferric sulfate. The ending ferrous means two. The O U S S, and the I C represents three. So we divide the solution into two. Try as much as possible to make the solution equal. So I'm going to use sodium hydroxide. As you can see, there's a brown precipitate being formed at the bottom of the test tube. So if you add excess sodium hydroxide, you continue adding until you excess. You see the ground precipitate is insoluble. So this indicates presence of iron three ions. So um, from that you're going to move to test for an ions. So an ions include sulfate, sulfite, carbonate, and chloride ions. So we're going to start with sulfates, sulfites, and carbonates. So in this test, you're going to use barium ions to test. And here we have barium chloride. So that's what you're going to use to test for the carbonates and sulfates and sulfites. So I'm going to start with the um, carbonates. So I'm going to use a solution of sodium carbonate. So just the same way, you make a solution out of the salt, so the carbonate. You don't need to take so much of the salt, just a little. You can make a solution out of it. Then you divide it into two. Portions. Then I'm going to use barium chloride to test for the presence of carbonate ions. You put about five drops of the solution. As you can see, there's a white precipitate insoluble. This indicates presence of carbonate ions. 
So um, let's move to test for sulfate ions. We do the same same procedure, but in this case we use sulfate salts. I'm going to use a little sulfate. Add water and shake the mixture to ensure that the salt dissolves. So, um, separate the solution to, re um, to remove the salt that has remained at the bottom of the crystal. I'm still going to use bajam chloride, so you put about five drops into the solution. A white precipitate insoluble is formed. As you can see, the solution is the precipitate is white. And the solution is white. So um, let's move to sulfite ions. So we are going to use um, sodium sulfite. We are going to make a solution out of sodium sulfite solution. So the major difference between sulfite and sulfate is sulfate has one more oxygen atom than sulfite. So, um, add more. Check the solution. And then you add the same same barium fluoride solution. About five drops. A white precipitate which is insoluble is formed. So this indicates presence of sulfate ions. So we've looked at our uh, presence of carbonate ions, sulfate ions, and sulfate ions. I'm going to move to test for iodide. So, um, in this solution, I'm going to use lead nitrate to test for presence of iodide, and I'm going to use a solution of potassium iodide. Take a little. Then make a solution. You shake the mixture to ensure solubility. Then you use lead nitrate. As you can see, there is a yellow precipitate insoluble in excess. So it's not in excess. But it's insoluble. I put about five drops of like of lead nitrate, so this indicates presence of iodide ions. So um, my friend is going to look at the solubility. So different salts, as you've seen, have different solubilities. Others dissolve in different solutions, while others don't. For example, we saw that zinc dissolves in both sodium hydroxide and ammonium hydroxide, while magnesium doesn't in both of them. So basically, solubility is a measure of the amount of the solute in grams that dissolves in 100 grams of water in a certain temperature. So while you're doing this, you're supposed to record the temperature, but time is not indicated. For example, if you're given a solid that is that dissolves at if we're given a solute that dissolves in four 
grams at this specific amount of solute. You're supposed to get how much we dissolve in 100 grams. Which you cross multiply. So it's 4.5 times 100 divided by 4. And with this, we're going to get the answer is 112.5 grams per 100 grams of water. In solubility, every soluble thing should be equivalent to 100 grams of water. And um, apart from salt, liquids also have solubility. For example, if you put water and um, HCl, you will see that when you increase the temperature, the solubility will increase. But in gases, the solubility will decrease because the gases will escape as you increase the temperature due to the increase of intermolecular distance. Um, Next, we are going to look at complex ions. When each compound dissolved in, for example, sodium hydroxide and ammonium hydroxide, they formed complex ions. For example, we have zinc. When zinc reacted with the zinc solid, reacted with the hydroxides, When the zinc reacted the hydroxide of the HCl, when the zinc reacted with the hydroxide of the sodium hydroxide, this was formed. This is zinc hydroxide. The two is kept here to balance because the valency of this is 2 and this is 1, so they interchange. This is upwards. This was when you put a few drops, but when you put it in excess, we formed this compound. comes about because then you balance that this compound is called an ion it's called a complex ion the zinc is together with four hydroxide ions and this negative two is a net charge because this produces negative two plus this one produces positive two but since this one produces negative one, but since there are four, it produces negative four and positive two, making negative two as an overall charge. It's up first because it is in liquid. So, how do you come up with a name for this? For this, we are going to call it tetra due to the four hydroxide ions. Hydroxyl to the hydroxide ions, zinc, and then we're going to add a superfix it because it is negative, and then at the end we're going to call it an ion because it has a charge. So tetra comes in because of the number. One is mono, while two is di. Three is tri and four is tetra. We have different types of anions. So one of them is hydroxyl, which is OH. OH is hydroxyl. Well, NH3 is going to be amine from the from the word ammonia. We have amine. Then we have water, which in this case would be called water 
what should be called hydra so um if the net charge here was positive too the name x will not be there and should be tetra hydroxyl zinc ion then um oh one thing i forgot sorry before the word ion to differentiate whether it's two or one or three plus or negative we put whatever number it is in roman numbers in this case it was two negative so the x is there and the two is there to represent the word two negative as the overall charge and then the word ion another example is lead when lead reacts with When lead reacts with hydroxyl, the hydro, when we put drop wise, this we got it from the sodium hydroxide. So the lead reacts and forms this. When kept clockwise, but when you put in excess, you form all this I have as form. So in fact, we have to know what the overall charge is. We come here and we see that. The lead is giving us positive 2, while the hydroxyl is giving us negative 1, but, negative one, but since they are 4, we multiply it by 4. So it's positive 2 plus negative 4, giving us negative 2. So the overall charge is the same, negative 2, and it's in upper form. So we need this again. We look at the number of the anions in the, in the complex ion, we have four of them. So the name again is derived and becomes tetra. Still, we have OH hydroxyl. This is lead. But since we are talking about in chemistry, we call it lamb. And lambda and two because this overlaps two. So generally, how you name a complex ion is you identify the number of ligands. This is called a ligand. So the number is four. In others, we have one, mono, two, di, three, tri, and now four, tetra and so on and so on. Then you name the ligand. So here we have a hydroxyl. That's why the second name is hydroxyl. It could be amine, it could be hydroxyl, it could be hydra. Then we have the, the fourth way, the third way is we look at the central cation, which is a lead, but in scientific it's called plumber, so it comes plum. Then, if it's negative, you add the word it, but if it's not, you leave it as plum. Then, you put, you look at the overall charge, whether it's negative 1, negative 2, whatever number is there, you put it in wrong man numbers, and then you put the word ion at the end. Next, we're going to talk about water hardness, and she's going to take us through that. Um, so... Um, what is water hardness? Um, so in simple term, <coughs> water that contains calcium ions, magnesium ions, chloride ions, sulfate ions, and hydrogen carbonate ions is, so is hard water. So um, presence of calcium and magnesium ions uh, refer is referred to as temporary hardness. So, um, you remove it mainly through boiling, 
but water with chloride and sulfate ions have permanent hardness so um, you remove it by other forms of removing hardness of water which, which you are going to look at now so um, you go straight to methods of softening water first of all we start with temporary hardness so um, you do it through boiling we all know we boil water to make it soft so this removes um, the calcium and magnesium ions so for example if we have cal calcium hydrogen carbonate so um basically in the hard water we have carbonate ions so when you introduce calcium metal or in any form calcium it will react with the carbonate ions to form calcium hydrocarbonate which is right now writing it in the board mm -hmm. and when you boil it you heat it therefore As you heat it, you're trying to break up this large compound into the small compounds. You see, um, after you've broken this uh, big compound which was in the water, you form calcium carbonate and water, which is soft, and carbon four oxide, which is one of the products of this. So, um, we've looked at uh, removal of hardness to boiling. So we go to distillation. It is used to remove both temporary and permanent hardness, but it, it is more expensive. So like it's not effective in this setting. So we move to um, addition of sodium carbonate. It removes both hardness. So if you add sodium carbonate, um, this, um, this calcium ions in dissociate plus the carbonate ions from the sodium carbonate form calcium carbonate which removes the hardness of water so your water will remain soft so another form is um, through ion exchange so hard water is passed through a column filled with complex sodium compounds which take in the hardness so your water becomes soft so that marks the end of this episode. I'm Lara Mbithi from, from Loreto Convent Valley Road. And I'm Lee Mohamed from Loreto Convent Valley Road. We're both in control. Thank you.